Awesome. How's everyone doing? Good. Last program of the day. I promise <laughs> this one will not take the entire time. So you're good. You're good. I'll make sure I'll, I'll try to combine both at the same time. I know when I'm in every conference every year, that was a, the last one was always like, okay, long, a lot of information, a lot to take in. So I try to keep it pretty pointed. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I don't think I know a lot of people in here, which is kind of cool. You know, I've been teaching aquaculture for almost 10 years. Uh, I don't teach anymore. Uh, I, this was my last year was my last year. So a little bit about my background. I taught at East Bay High School for eight years uh, aquaculture program. We had a, um, a 36, 36 barrel vault system, like the crib keepers we saw earlier. Uh, did mostly all fresh water. We did some uh, saltwater fish, brackish. We did some uh, redfish back in the day, using the affluent to grow mangroves for a while. What I used to do is uh, to give a little background on that because now I don't have a picture of that system because I'm not there anymore. But uh, essentially I would change on the program every year. We would do something of a different species year to year. So one year we would do redfish, next year we did some cold water fish, another year we did ornamentals. Ornamentals is my background, so uh, my family is in the fish business. I grew up as a fish farmer on a large uh, scale angelfish production. So freshwater angels, we would do anywhere between half a million to a million a year, just at the farm level. Uh, and then after that, my family ended up going into business with a bunch of other farmers, setting up a, a co-op as you of other farmers to distribute to other pet stores around the country and over the years those farmers for whatever reason decided they wanted to get out um, and now my family is the sole owner of the business for the last 15 years so as well as have a distributorship where we sell to other pet stores we also have a full farm operation that's about seven acres where we produce stuff in earthen ponds and then we also have a nursery and grow out greenhouses as well for stuff that a little bit more temperature sensitive like angelfish so we do um, angelfish we do about um Eight to ten thousand a month in angelfish production. We do severums. Uh, don't know which of those are. I'll have to send you guys a link. I'll leave some cards on the desk for some stuff. You guys need help with this sort of aspect of things. I'm also still glad to help because I'm still not teaching, but I'm still connected pretty well on at least the ornamental side of the business. Um, outside of the uh, outside of that, I'm also on the board of directors for the Florida Aquaculture Association. Truthfully, I joined the board to save my job about five years ago. Uh, when certifications, if you, how many teach ag, ag instead of marine science? Just curious. Marine science teaches everybody else. So for ag teachers, certification is a big deal for elective programs now. So five years, six years ago, I saw it coming down the pipeline. If there isn't a certification tied to a, an elective, it will disappear. So I made a big push to push for a certification along with a few other farmers that saw the need for it. So uh, I joined the FA in hopes to get a certification on board and get the right people involved. And uh, super happy the lab took over that responsibility for a lot of it, which was super helpful. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, but now I, I don't teach anymore. I went back to industry. So now I run the retail operations for our business. So now instead of just selling the pet stores, uh, we go direct to consumer for everything. Um, everything from fish to dry goods, bacteria starters, things like that. So you need a connection for that sort of stuff uh, and you're all in state like that. So I can try to be as helpful as I can. So like I said, I'll leave some cards on the end of the desk before I leave. So feel free to hit me up. It's got my cell phone on it, my email. Just let me know what you need. Um, Here's where I'd say that neither USDA nor FDAX endorses any particular company or... Oh, I don't mean it like that. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Oh, sure. But, but we clearly like Dan. You are hey, welcome yeah. Or if you need one that's a closer to you, I'm, I still have pretty good connections. Also, be on the board with the Sturgeon Farmers, uh, Alligator Farms, you know, Tilapia guys down south. So if you need some contacts in those areas, I can hook you up with those as well. So a little bit of that. All right. So I wanted to be. I guess as, as blunt with you as possible. I wanted to do it from my teacher hat where I gave you the things that I think went well, the things that I didn't do very well and things I would probably make better. So maybe it avoids some pitfalls you might have. Um, we'll kind of start with, we're gonna tie it all in together at one thing. So a little bit of what I wanna talk about, sort of how I set up the courses when I started teaching, my methodology, how I approach to building lessons for the courses. And then how I try to lay out uh, everything I want to do on a weekly basis. And then I'll give you some tips and tricks of things that I thought went well throughout my eight or nine years teaching. 
So when I started teaching, I also went through the alternative certification program. I didn't know anything about teaching. And uh, the guy before me left me a flash drive with a bunch of things. As I went through them, they didn't make any sense to me. Um, I didn't understand it. And I'm like, okay, this doesn't even make sense at any level. So I took some extra classes. So I eventually figured it out. So what I tried to do is set it up and, and, and I made it very um, heavy in production. I wanted to give one thing I noticed a lot of my kids, I'm sure you guys know it too. These kids have very little soft skills. They don't understand communicating. They don't understand what responsibility looks like. Um, so I made it very heavy into they had a routine. And uh, like five years ago, we had a speaker at one of our you know professional days and he runs a, a center for like worth ethic, uh, the Center for Work Ethic Institute. And he said, out of the research they did, 80% of the kids who were successful, no matter what demographic they came from, um, the kids who had routines as a kid and had chores were the ones who were the most successful. I don't know how anecdotal it was or anything like that, but I really took that to kind of heart and kind of to said, okay, I need to set up a better routine structure for how I approach things to at the very least give some kids some soft skills and at least start building their confidence up. Because I don't know if you've noticed that or not, but these kids have no confidence in anything they do. They don't, they don't know. They're scared. They're timid. They can't communicate for nothing to talk to people. So that was a big deal of how I tried to set it up. So for aquaculture too, it was basically an introductory husbandry style course. So everything was like the basics on how you do things. So you need to start learning terminology. You need to start learning the types of fish we would do, right? So we did everything from redfish to uh, hormone-induced spawning of goldfish. Uh, weren't very successful. We were kind of successful with that, but we did okay. And then we did, you know, and then I had uh, upper-level classes do different projects as well. So aquaculture two, we had a greenhouse of three rows of 12, these concrete vats. Their job was to maintain them. Their job was water quality, feeding, how much they fed had to be logged, what the water quality was, how to be logged, and that's what they would do. My, depending on the year, it used to be where my culture three was a separate class. So my advanced kids were always in a different level class. They would then approach and go outside and they would basically have their check sheet and say, these students did not or did do this today, right? Was there a lot of leftover feed in the tanks? There was, they overfed the tanks, right? And they'll make a little mark and suggestions to the group from the previous period, right? Or whatever time of day it is, right? So, and then what I would try to do is either have a kid that I've had for three or four years, they would then go behind all of my other aquaculture three students where they would then check them as like a final check or I would do it depending on who was there, right? And then what I also try to do in aquaculture three classes is I really try to make them the management style part of the greenhouse um, for those aquaculture two kids. So their first thing to ever do was to go through the greenhouse, say these things were done, right? The aquaculture two had my outside rows. My inside rows was their projects, what they wanted to do, what they wanted to focus on. And truthfully, I was pretty flexible. I gave them like a menu, like you would see like a lunch menu. And I'd say, these are the fish you can pick from this year. What do you want to do? It gives them a little ownership where they get a little bit more freedom of choice of what they want to do. Because most ornamental fish were not, you know, they're not very expensive to get pairs and some breeding groups. I was leveraging my you know, ability to get those things. So I let them pick a little bit what they wanted to do. And then maybe uh, no, five years ago, five years ago, uh, we were approached to try to open up an aquaculture four course. So I don't remember who was on that committee, but it was me and a few farmers, some from DOE and a few other teachers, I think, to develop a course of like, what, what does that look like to have an advanced course? And I really wanted it to be set up as more of an internship style research project based course. These kids have already been through a couple levels. If not had them for three years, this might be their senior year, right? And they're doing either an internship of some farm that was local to us or some sort of research project we were going to put in the ag fair, right? That was the two kind of ideas behind it. Um, so, and then obviously if I had them for multiple days, we had those kids in directed studies and I'd had those just general help. We needed to do this, move fish. And I would use those kids for those projects as well. All right. So how I tried to approach the curriculum and what I was doing is one, I try to make things, the earlier in the week, I would use it for more of a broader topic thing. And I would do it in two, two ways. It would be an introduction to what we're covering for the day. It could have been a news topic like, you know, red tide coming up, how we're producing salmon down south, or it could have been just more generalized to them. Like 
how do you gain more skills in X, Y, Z? And I'd make it a more general day for them. Or talking about this, still having to go outside and do things, right? So we had um, we had 15 minute courses. So we do 20 minutes inside, 20 minutes outside, and then we'd wrap up in 10 minutes. Typically, it would be my normal day. And then once we got past the Monday or the, the beginning day of the week, we'd have like um, some recall, some review of what we've done the previous week. You know, basic review sheets, discussion based questions. I was real big at asking why to pay pretty much every day. Like whatever it is, why did, why did you do that? Why did you log this? Why did you, you know, once we got past the initial stage of, of you know, learning about what they're doing, because as you'll see here, I'll, I'll explain that in a second. So, um, so yeah, group activities, greenhouse teams. And uh, I try to rotate the team. So it would be the same group doing it all the time. Um, I want them to get to know new people because if they sit in the same group with the same exact people for the entire year, uh, sometimes they'll pass up on things. They won't do things as much and moving them makes them uncomfortable because they don't know how to interact with people that they don't know. And it's, it's very uncomfortable. It's like watching the office to me because these kids <laughs> don't know what to do. And it's really funny, but it makes them, it gives them that awkwardness that it, it helps them. I think when they start learning to present papers and stuff. So then we'll move into the project slash problem approach where I'll take whatever unit we're working on. And I'm going to break it down into a type of problem where they're going to have to go fix it. And I'm asking, like, again, more general questions. What, when, where, how, why? Like, why did it break? What broke? How would you fix it? And make them detail out basically a step-by-step -step analysis of what's going on, right? So to give you a couple of examples, we would do system design, right? So recirculating systems like you guys are going to know. I would go in there, and after we've done our whole unit, right, we've talked about how it works. We've gone through the components of vocabulary. We've looked at pictures. We've done some more review. I'll go outside and I would break all three systems and I would put numbers on different pieces, a lot like the FAA CDE. And I would just say, what's wrong with this? Give me some numbers. And I give them a question bank and say, we're not question bank, but I give you questions like what's wrong with it? What or a scenario based on top of that. So what's wrong? How we fix it? What are some steps to do that? And how would you avoid this from, or how would you prevent this from happening again? Right? And I would do that for pretty much every unit. So it's kind of similar based questions, but it makes them have to think outside the box as to why, right? So you know, maybe my filter was in the wrong place or my UV is now before my bead filter, right? Put your, before you, put your UV, UV before your bead filter, you're killing off all your good bacteria. So what filter are you, you know, you're not building a good biological filter, right? And I would do those kind of things and rearrange them as best I could, you know, and make them kind of answer those big picture questions. Um, and also I, I do believe that helps in their communication skills. Cause not only did I write down, I make them tell me, right? So I don't know if your uh, admin was like mine, but every time I had evaluation, okay, we'll go sit there. Okay, why do you think that is? We had to do it anyway. So that's just how, I mean, that's how our, ad, our admin was. They're asking those questions. I might as well ask them. And it does help in their retention too. I think so anyway. So, um, and then at the end of the day, when we're done or at the end of the week, I always make them reflect. What do you think went well? What do you think went good? You know, what went bad? How would you change it? How would you fix it? What didn't you like? And even if they said they didn't like the lesson, I don't care. But why didn't you like the lesson? You know, as long as what the answer was, oh, it's too hot outside. You know, that's the most common thing. It's hot outside today, Mr. Connor. It's hot outside. I don't want to go outside today. I don't, I don't teach in a... Uh, it's a very, you know, my, the kids I would get normally were um, seniors who needed science credits. So a lot of them weren't picking to get there. It's like, hey, you're here, but um, this is what you got. So take it or leave it, I guess, is a good way to put it. All right. So a little bit more breakdown in the week. I forgot where I put this slide. So Mondays, we do an article, we do a video, we introduce a new topic, give that big picture sort of overarching question, right? And then... Um, make them give me some general answers to some information I gave them, right? Kind of start off the week. And then Tuesdays when we start breaking into technical information and we start doing the vocab was big. For Aqua 2, I do a lot of vocabulary because there's a lot of things they don't know what this thing is. And I make them do the term, talk about what it is and give me a picture of what it looks like. Some way to define it. If there is a word that you do not know, there are probably other people in this room that don't know that word. Please make a note of it on the classroom, send me an email, whatever it is. We will start a glossary of terms, just so you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Good point. Yep. Lots of things. So, and that took up most of the day, right? 
Wednesday was always my presentation or notes day. We're going through our PowerPoint. We're talking about whatever topic it is, um, things like that. And then Thursday, we'll review from what we did previous weeks. And, you know, I will mention Friday was normally our lab day regardless, but we'll have other lab days mixed in depending on what part of the year it is. Once we get past January, we're in here half the day. I'm outside half the day because I want to keep that routine up. They have to go out, take care of their fish, clean their tanks. And I did it every day if I could, probably two to three days a week. My upper level kids that had their own period, it was three days a week minimum outside. Um, and again, I, I think that's it's more the soft skill side of things, right? Those kids didn't have that. These kids didn't do their own laundry. They didn't wash dishes at home. That's just the kids I had. They didn't do any of those things. So I'm like, my gosh, what is this kid going to do when he graduates? You know, what are they going to do? Can this I ask you a softball question? Sure. Um, how important is it for that kind of experience for these students to understand just how much really goes into this, right? That people who do this commercially full time as a job, it's it's a lot of work. It's yeah. not just putting the goldfish in a bowl. Would you say that's important? It, that's yeah. An important aspect of this kind of engagement with them. Yeah. So a couple a couple things to that. One, um, it teaches. I think it teaches the you know the value of harder work. It's not the easiest thing, right? It also wasn't. We're not outside in fish ponds, you know. Like that's really difficult work. We're in a, inside greenhouse it's somewhat hot but it's not that terrible but at least gives them the value of 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 hard work for one but then two i do we do have several students a year that want to go into the business um outside of this greenhouse work if they did ask they want to go into business i would take them back to our farm like we're going to pump ponds today you got one day to work on the old farm if you can pump ponds we can drain and same fish out and you still want to do this I think you're golden. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I only had a handful of people that wanted to do that after we did that. I'd have about 15 a year that would want to go out and do that. And I take them uh, sometimes early in the year when it's cold, like November, or and I would take them in the middle of the heat right before school gets out. It just depends on what they wanted um, or when we had the, the time. What was your retention rate after that experience? Um, probably like 33%, roughly. So it wasn't terrible. So we were putting out, you know, it depends on the year, but we were putting out at least five to eight kids a year on the average, probably to industry. Uh, still have, you know, I don't know, probably 30, 40 kids still work in the business at some level, some way, or it led them to something else they enjoyed, marine sciences, conservation through aquaculture, that sort of thing, where they're in college or doing something now. So some sort of idea for that. Oh yeah, so sorry, lab days as needed. So some of the labs and projects I would have the kids work on, depending on the level. So, you know, production was my background. So I wanted to be pretty heavy in that section of it. So we would do a lot of raising and breeding of different fish, mostly ornamentals. We still did stuff like tilapia. We never bred the redfish. That wasn't something we were able to do in our systems. They weren't big enough, but we used to get them from uh, Fish and Wildlife used to do redfish for schools. I'm pretty sure they still do it. Somebody does that. If they do it, anyway, they still do it or whatnot. But given that, I grew up to something bigger. And then I don't know what you're supposed to do with them after that because you can't restock them due to genetics. Um, so we would not eat them. Yeah. <laughs> not I don't know. They would, spontaneously they would just disappear um, at the end of the year as a fundraiser. <laughs> just some ideas. So, um, so we did anything from, from that. And obviously when you're breeding fish, you have to have some sort of live food cultures going. And uh, those are some easy projects that kids can kind of get started with growing some Artemia um, was probably the easiest one we did. And I had some other kids wanted to do worm cultures and stuff for some fish they were working with. And, and on top of that, this depended on what fish they chose, right? What live foods they were going to use. So um, it just depends. And then water quality monitoring was across the board in every class. Um, a lot, I put it pretty heavy on my, my beginner level students, aqua two students, because I want them to get that foundation of like, this is where your problems are going to start. If you can fix this and know why your water quality is off, you have a better chance of survival, right? Because in our aspect, I always refer back to what is the purpose of this course? It's how to make what? Money, because that's essentially what it is, right? The more fish you lose, the more money you lose. It's a live product. So I try to say, oh, your fish is going to lose X amount of dollars. You lost this many fish. What's your survival rate? How are you doing with the with the eggs or you know the live bears, whatever they're doing? You know, I relate back to that so they would know. And then obviously I talked about it earlier weekly husbandry pass, feeding, subbing tanks, visual inspection of fish. So do you see fish that are flashing? Are they moving? Right? Because if you notice in your tanks as you look down, 
your fish could have parasites over time and you'll see them start, you know, dipping down in the tanks. They're scratching their body. They've got some sort of parasite that they got to itch, right? So try and get rid of it like that. And then we talk about um, as they get a little bit more advanced towards in the year, we start talking about fish health and, you know, we do a few years. I've only done it a couple of years, but we did uh, a crop season on a few fish and look through that and what to look for for that sort of thing. And um, I didn't do it every year. It was uh, a little more challenging a couple, you know, last three or four years or so to get the kids doing that. And then for my Aqua 3 and Up kids, we would do group and or individual um, species project slash protocols. So I would make, so part of these projects were basically protocols for the greenhouse, right? Systematize what we're already doing anyway, in a way they have to communicate and lay out on a piece of paper and present. Right. So setting up live food cultures. Right. That's their project for half the year, at least. Right. Where they've got us dedicate so many time, to, uh, so many days a week to that. Plus the stuff they had outside. I just try to keep them busy. Right. Because anytime you give those kids downtime, that's when problems happen because they don't, you know, and I, at least the kids I dealt with, you'd have more problems in the classroom. But if I kept them busy and in, engaged and in, in doing that, there are a lot less problems going on. This was just an example of one I had pulled. Uh, I apologize, I lost a, a lot of my stuff on my school drive like two years ago. So I'm trying to like piece together what I had before I left. Uh, there should be, I don't know if you have any files of any of the stuff I sent you anywhere, somewhere. somewhere. Anyway, there's some sheets and modules and stuff and some folders of all the units I had and some of its bits and pieces of stuff I found or forgot about. I just threw it all together, see what works for you. And that's the best way to do it. Adapt it, what makes sense to you. For anything, I'll, I'll put up here today. So just some ideas. So lab stations, the way we worked is we had designated specific tanks um, for different activities. And obviously, like I said, we did feeding, water quality monitoring, live feeds. And then we never did uh, animal health until the end of, towards the end of the year. It's a lot to tackle um, as you cover. I don't know if you have the aquaculture textbooks, but we use those as some of our reference points, some of the CERAC pubs, some of the ES pubs. And we start, you know, with basic animal health, right? We'll talk about uh, parasites mostly. We'll talk about internal parasites, external parasites, kind of show them some ideas of what that looks like, uh, bacteria, and then um, uh, fungal issues, which was this last one we talked about. Uh, and just like I talked about earlier, we just did task lists. They had to do so many tasks for their grade, right? Their group had so many things and they had to initial what they did to get their grade for the day. Right, and their initials had to be clear. The bottom of their lab report had all of their names. You know, they initial next to what they did. So the person from my Aqua 3 class could say, okay, Dan fed the fish and uh, checked pH today. That's what Dan did, right, for their system. And this is his reflection on what he thought went well with that system, right? So that sort of uh, is how I set up the lab grades as far as, as far as how that worked. And then the project grades looked a little bit different. Um, depending on what year we, we did it, a lot of times I would make the project grades, they could do it as a group, whereas like a few of them wanted to do something like as a bigger, bigger thing, or I'd let them do it individually if they'd like to. It was kind of like a pick or choose. So we had students that would do anything from setup protocols for live, different live feeds to uh, production of something where they wanted to produce money. They wanted to make a monetary value out of it, which I allowed them to do. Um, they weren't very successful at it, but they didn't go broke, which was cool. They had to track all their expenses. And by the way, if you teach, if you teach, um, teach ag, this count, this could count towards one of their, oh gosh, I've been out a year. The, the ag proficiency awards, what am I, yeah. So that's a good one for that as well. Uh, we didn't do that one as much. I think I only had maybe two groups do that over the years. So that's an idea for that. Well, they're already doing it in class anyway. Right. So, so they had to track, you know, their, what they fed, how much they fed, what that food cost. Is that the food they wanted to keep using? Do they want to change to a cheaper food? What's the difference in a cheaper food? They notice any difference in their water quality levels, if they fed too much, too little, right? Those sort of things, just to get them to think about it. It's more about realizing why and why not versus, you know, as much as I'd say this, they did it, but it's more the why or why not. Because what I see, not, not just with this, but you'll notice these kids, you tell them to do something. They'll do that one thing, and then what do they do? They stop. They don't do nothing. They just stand there and stare at you. 
Like, it's just weird. So the goal was to never just, I'm like, I can't do this. Like, just this is what else you got to do. Yeah, they just do that. And, then that. and I think that translates to when a lot of people, at least, you know, from, yeah, right? They can't. So try to get them thinking outside the box of how to continue a task and keep moving forward rather than just go, you know, one thing at a time and stop and be like, oh, you still have these things to do. Well, why do you do that type thing, right? And in industry or I think any job that these kids are getting, they are going to, they are stopping and doing one task. And they're stopping to do one task. And we have a workforce coming up that has got to have no ability to do anything outside of you standing next to them and saying, go do this. And, and that's think. So I pushed pretty hard for this part of the curriculum to kind of like get them to think about that as well. So just some, I, I just throw in everything I got. It's going to be like, you know, pass on a wall, take what you want, throw what you don't need and go from there. Dan, huh. um, so comment, I've got high school teachers um, program overview phase four start a business so listen to what he was saying so that's the kind of the general idea is um how would you start a business on this what do you need to get done what are your like there's a, an entire spreadsheet for analysis of what you're doing and all kinds of stuff like that so that's kind of what Dan's talking about is that like broad picture we don't need very like specifics but getting them to think about outside of the box instead of just you know specific details is that it as a whole yeah and just some ideas of little projects or little things i would have them do um compare and contrast you know what's the difference you know very basic but what's the difference in your wild caught stock versus an aquaculture product what does that look like i'd bring in some fish and i would show them we had uh we did a compare and contrast of wild caught cardinal tetras and cultured wild caught oh uh, cultured cardinal tetras what do they look like do you notice a difference Does their body shapes does their colors look different here's the money how much you paid for them now what do you think about this this is how much a aquaculture product costs this is how much a wild caught product costs right what do you think is a difference and then we just kind of get them thinking about those you know just to get them thinking so they don't sit there and say i don't know i don't, I don't take that answer so um something like that Unit tests, how I did unit tests a lot of times. First off, I didn't give any real written tests. I didn't give homework and I didn't give any written tests. I wanted their unit test to be hands-on as best as possible. So that problem, that uh, problem project type thing, that's what I did for pretty much every unit. It was an outside base where they had to apply whatever we talked about in that unit. So if it was feeds, you were making feeds. If it was um, animal, um, Aquatic animal health, they had to figure out how to do a diagnostic on that by doing a basic skin scrape and showing me what it looks like. If they were doing the, the system design, right, they're breaking it. If they're doing water quality testing, it could be a scenario, right? And they had to answer why they did this and what could go wrong and how to fix it. That's what I did for basically every unit, right? And um, it was a better way to get them to explain what was going on than just giving me an A, B, C, or D answer, right? Because those kids... They're good at memorizing. They're very good at that, but give them to explain why and they just shut down. Look, 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 look. That's what it is. Uh, and they can't copy that as easy either. So just some ideas. I wrote down some more like tips that I thought helped me and things that I didn't think went as well, since now I can feel like I can reflect on what went well or not. So I wrote some more notes down. Uh, things I would definitely mention. Um, Make it a point to show your admin and your guidance counselors what you're working on as best as possible. Um, for us, the way it worked is a little bit, my school is a little bit different. If you show them, they're likely to help put kids in your program. If that makes sense to show them, oh, well, this class is available. I don't know, does your guidance counselors know your program exists? Ours didn't. If I didn't go up to my guidance counselor like, hey, aquaculture is an honor science class in aquaculture two and three, it's considered a program completer for Gold Seal, which is still available. There's actually scholarships now available through Gold Seal that if you are a program completer and complete 10 hours of community service, it was like a lot, you know, I forgot what it was as far as payout. It was over 50% for that type of school. Plus, you know, one mention of separate of this, Mike Rowe has a foundation that funds um, career and tech type programs. So if the kids aren't interested in going to college per se and they want to go to career tech school, that's a two-year program for like aquaculture or, or anything really. They don't have a GPA requirement. You have to sign a work ethic, you know, paper 
and give them re and three recommendations. And they don't even have enough kids applying for the program um, to get the money. So another thing to consider, just something else I remembered just now as we're talking, don't forget <laughs> to say that. Um, our culture can be very demanding. It could be a seven day a week job. Setting up a one tank thing, if it was me, they sell these uh, automatic feeders you could buy now anywhere on Amazon. Put some automatic feeders in for the weekends, right? Just make sure it's like a pelleted type food. So at least the weight, because it's going to distribute it by weight, it'll be easier to drop out and you're not going to have to hopefully come over the weekend as much, right? You know, give yourself a couple days off, you know, have some kids check in if they can, if they're older, if they can, or bring your parents, whatever it is, but put in an automatic feeder. You do the water change on Monday. I promise it's not going to, as long as your tank isn't to the rim stocked, right? Just have some fish. We're, we're, we're growing, right? But it's not at a full maximum, you know, capacity, right? Not full density, whatever fish you're doing, right? So help yourself out, get a belt feeder, get a little automatic feeder you can stick on the side of the tank. So it's not going to be as bad. Yes, ma'am. Price. For those, depends. So the commercial ones are probably like 130 for the belt feeders, there's nothing, there's not even batteries in it. It's just mechanical. You pull it back, you put the feed on the on the thing, and it just over time winds down. Right? You put one of those on it. The ones on Amazon that are small, like 25 bucks. Um, you might have to mount it to like a piece of wood across your tank for those big ones, but but well, you still could do it relatively inexpensive. It's on Amazon Prime in two days. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So there's that. And then last thing I would say, and this is my only plug for FA, but certifications are tied to every elective. I don't know if your school does as bad as ours, but if our, in our district, we've started removing every class that doesn't have a certification. And the teacher isn't teaching towards that certification. Um, it's a big deal as far as keeping the longevity of your program. To me, it's a sustainable mechanism, right? And don't forget your program gets, it's different by every district I know, but it's like 50 bucks a teacher and like 600 per kid who passes it for your program. Tiffany right. Talk more about this She'll talk more about tomorrow. I want to take her thunder away, but it's a good yeah. deal for funding your program. Right. Yeah. And then a few things I didn't do that I wish I would have done better. Looking back, I did. So we taught high school. We our feeder program um, got shut down like four years ago. I didn't do a good enough job promoting to our middle school right there to, hey, this is a good program you come take. Right. Um, I wish I had done a better job of that. So getting your, those younger kids from the high school, right. For if you're a high school teacher, getting some younger kids interested by doing a little science demo, or if they're close by doing a little invite to your program really goes a long way to building your program up. Cause your goal is you got to get kids year after year. Um, my program was a different scenario. I taught at the end of the day, I was only teaching seniors who needed science credit. So that was my own downfall, right? So for most teachers, you want to keep it sustainable. you got to get the younger kids, the crazy ninth graders that don't know what school is yet. And they're just all over the place, right? You got to start somewhere. So start in the middle of school, start when you're eighth grade and uh, just make an introduction to them. And they, they'll find something to attach to because those kids are looking for identity more than anything. They don't have an identity yet. And if they find you and you're receptive to them, that's who they're hanging on to. I don't care what program they're going into. I don't care if they're going to be, you know, graduating by the time they're a sophomore. It doesn't matter. They will attach to your program because they don't have any of that yet. They're going to a brand new thing and they're, you know, they're scared. They're timid. These kids are bigger than them. It's a big deal. So that's something uh, uh, I didn't do well, but I wish I would have done looking back now. All right. We'll keep moving things. Biggest thing I probably did is I tried to keep it consistent from day one. Hey, this is a lot. This is a 50, 50 class. We are outside half the time. You just better be prepared. I don't care if you got to bring new shoes or put bags over your feet. Whatever you got to do, these are the days we go. Like it or not, we're going. I don't care. There's no sitting. No, we're not doing that. This is the way it goes. So I think that helped set that routine, set that expectation. So the kids, you know, don't have the, oh, I'm not going outside today. You know, no, no. Day one, they go. Day one. Um, so this goes back to where I, where when all my admins started asking all those questions, I'm like, I better start doing it all myself anyway. Probing questions as they're doing their labs, like where they're still learning the material, not so much their routine, um, helped a lot with comprehension, I felt, uh, felt like. Obviously anecdotal, you know, just something I felt looked, worked really well as far as them um, understanding and comprehending the material worked really well.
And then lastly, reflecting um, for them, I did it a couple of different ways. Um, I'd make them do a parking lot. You know, parking lot, if you have a couple of strategies, you have like a poster board on the wall. Oh, do you? Perfect, perfect. You know, you know what I'm talking about. So I did that to make them reflect, put it in their logbook when they were recording all their data. What do they like? What do they not like? How did it go? You know, what did they think went wrong? Why? And then I kind of skim through them as I could for the week and they get their weekly grade for that sort of reflecting. But I think it helps for the communication skills a lot. All right. Sorry. Questions? No, that's statewide. That's a, state thing. that's a state thing. So Aqua 2 and Aqua 3 are is a statewide honor science class. And my, I guess, guidance counselor should have known. Should know that. Yeah, should. Probably don't. She doesn't. Yeah. So that helps too. Yeah. Any other questions for Dan? All right. Well, thank you. Such a great job. Thank you so much. Dan.